be off and running. Hopefully mine will just do the talking for me, almost. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Stevens Point, Wisconsin, UW Stevens Point. I've been to Charleston a number of times. Uh, in fact, I uh, have downloaded some previous papers that have gotten good usage, and it's really a great conference. Uh, I'm a big Bob fan. I went to a session yesterday, so I've kind of got Bob permission anyway for my title. Okay, we're moving. So I'm talking about changes in Wisconsin and actually in higher education. So there's been a lot of I'm trying to bring reason back to back home, much less back to the world of libraries. Uh, you can see a lot of the points here, implications nationally. I'm clicking to some headlines that have occurred in Wisconsin as kind of public funding has been taken away from higher education. I work at a public university. It's made a lot of things very difficult, and yet there's always hope. So I'm not going to click on all my headlines, but if you could just kind of see those. Uh, when times were good, not that long ago, it was 98, we had a great historical accord where UW system came to our rescue, and we used that just this past year with the American Chemical Society. Thankfully, they came to our rescue again. Not that rescuing is a really should be required. Anyway, in Wisconsin and a lot of other public universities, we've had a severe drop in funding from the state of what's in our case Wisconsin. In this case you see we've lost funding by one-third public funds. That's implicated my own campus where in uh, three biennials we lost almost 20 million dollars. And uh, there's the local story, Stevens Point. Uh, we've lost a lot of enrollment and that means tuition dollars too. Uh, we made the New York Times headlines just within a year ago when our provost announced we will do away with the humanities. Well, that didn't fly good on, by me or a lot of other people on my campus, so we kind of occupied a building, not quite, that was me 30 years ago. Anyway, uh, you can see the decline here. Nevertheless, we've had a 22% drop of enrollment, a lot of it just because of bad press. Um, my slides really do move fast, yes. Okay, so how do we share our pieces of pie as they shrink? It gets more and more challenging, especially when vendors really gives us some bad surprises. Again, we've down to 11% of state tax support, but at one time it was over 20. My own library, you can see our drops in our budget lines, and yet in the scenarios that we now face now, how do we project for renewals and you know just percentile increases sometimes two percent sometimes twenty percent so anyway this is the tangled up in red not tangled up in blue like that anyway uh, again this is just a jump from uh, three years time at one time we were at eight hundred thousand dollar acquisitions budget down to seven hundred and five I should say that first year of eight hundred thousand we got a mid-year cut over a hundred thousand just by a new administrative structure on my own campus. Um, just last year, in the last two years, we've become a receiving institution, which is actually good. They merged the two-year colleges with the four-year college, and we got a boost because we were aggressive to get some money to fund the two years supporting them. But that money could be going away almost within a year of having gotten it, just because of the condensing of needs or of uh, departments on my own campus, now they're threatening to take away student tech fees at Stevens Point. This really sounds gloomy, but you know, we're librarians, we're in education, there is hope. But now this is a dash in our hope. Um, this past year, and I see some familiar faces again, you know this story, but dealing with the ACS was really challenging. We, Canopy is kind of going crazy with expenditures. Elsevier is looming around the corner, so these are the things we're working through. We rallied our own campus here, writing our chancellor, the library allied with the academic departments, and actually it worked. Our chancellor talked to the UW system president, and they revived that previous agreement where system would share some cost uh, sharing. That doesn't mean that the American Chemical Society was right in jacking us up from 30% to 51,000 as our share. 
there's a lot more to all these little numbers I'm throwing. We'll be moving here. Okay, so we did get out of that mess, if it was a mess. We agreed to go ahead. However, the same year we had to deal with IEEE, we were very fortunate. We were only paying very small rate, and yet how could we suddenly pay $16,000? It was impossible. Again, I'm summarizing. Um, so we, we are one of the ones that said we can't do that. These are the three or four rounds we've been going through here. Again, we're relating to things that are happening across the nation and actions that have been taken from New York to California. Um, we're almost at the end here. And uh, so, the, uh, this is again our canopy spending, which has tripled our original allocation. I'll see if I can move it here faster now. Uh, and I know there's been talks about the shrinking marketplace. My former colleague Doug Wade just gave a great one who's now the dean at Tuck Libraries. Anyway, we're trying to relate to the actions that are taking across the nation and how we as little old Stevens Point can kind of make a rebound. And so my slides are done, I'm out of time, but we're not out of time for a return to reason. And anyway, education through my hope. We allied with our own consortia, Wisconsin, and those that really have helped us at our sister universities and its uh, system headquarters. And I want to do the same with all of you. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll move along. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Sorry, that's my time. See, I finished early. Yeah. <laughs> so our next uh, speaker is Adam Blackwell. Can I have this few seconds? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm Adam Blackwell, and since I only have six minutes and 40 seconds, I'm going to get straight to it and talk really fast. <laughs> In 2015, uh, ProQuest and the Shoah Foundation entered into a partnership. Our primary objective was to increase usage of an archive of interviews with Holocaust survivors. In order to see how we could make the archive more useful in scholarly research, I interviewed faculty at US and UK institutions, but I also wanted to talk to some German researchers. So, one Monday morning, I emailed about 40 faculty at two of Munich's big research institutions and asked them to meet with me to discuss their research. Almost immediately, the replies came in, and by close of business on Tuesday, I had filled up my calendar. But on Thursday, when I arrived at the office, I saw I had a cancellation email. Someone had muddled up their dates. Later that morning, someone else mailed, emailed me to say their plans had changed. By Friday, a dozen appointments had become just three. So, I emailed one of the guys who backed out and asked him what was going on. And he told me that after replying to my email, he and his colleagues had learned that a ProQuest sales rep was visiting their campus and trying to get the library to subscribe to ProQuest databases. At first, these researchers, remember, had addressed me in highly collegial terms. Uh, dear Adam, if I may. Uh, but after they learned about the ProQuest sales rep doing the rounds on their campus, they uh, stopped addressing me like that. And they, it was clear they no longer saw me as a fellow researcher, but as an outsider. Here's what I think the moral of this story is. When researchers think about ProQuest primarily as a profit-driven company, their willingness to work with ProQuest on matters of mutual interest declines. Their skepticism is often expressed as a belief that private entities shouldn't benefit from the unpaid labor of academic researchers. I understand this view, I get it, but I don't share it. I think private companies and academic institutions can work together and I'm going to show you what this cooperation might look like with reference to ProQuest's flagship dissertations product, PQDT. All right, let's just state the obvious. ProQuest does profit from the research of graduate students. When dissertations and theses are submitted to ProQuest, they go into an archive that ProQuest sells. However, I think for most people, the belief that a company like ProQuest shouldn't profit from academic research isn't an absolute, and in some cases, it may be okay. Like when ProQuest provides researchers with something of material value in return. And this is what I'm gonna spend my remaining, or oh, less, less than that, my six minutes and 40 seconds while I have left of discussing. First point, 
Submission has no material downside for the author. The agreement you make with ProQuest is non-exclusive, which means that you, as an author, are free to deposit your dissertation in your IR and anywhere else. But you also get several benefits by adding your dissertation to PQDT. One is the assurance that if your house burns down and your IR is hacked, your work will not be lost. When a dissertation is submitted to ProQuest, we make a bunch of physical and digital copies and put them in super secure physical and digital storage facilities. We also do some basic QA, ensuring, for example, that there is consistency between the way your name is spelled in the content of your dissertation and in the associated metadata. We also enhance this metadata. Where it's helpful for discoverability, we add new keywords, subjects, and indexing terms. But the most important benefit ProQuest offers dissertations for this is what we often refer to as reach. Reach means we take your dissertation and we make it available to a global research community. Here's how. When your dissertation goes into PQDT, it is immediately available for views, downloads, and citations from millions of researchers at thousands of institutions. This group includes lots of advanced researchers, or the kind who published in the peer-reviewed literature. There's another way submission to PQ, PQDT exposes your dissertation to these advanced researchers. Every year, organizations like the APA and the MLA review the dissertations that we add to PQDT. And they include citations to the relevant ones in their indexes. Indexes that are used by advanced researchers in all major disciplines. Submission to PQ, PQDT increases the reach of your dissertation in another important way, via ProQuest partnership with Google Scholar. Adding your dissertation to PQDT isn't the only way of making it available to Google Scholar users, but it may be the most reliable. Here's why I say that. While it's true that Google will crawl your IR, there are lots of different document types in most IRs, and Google Scholar sweeps them up indiscriminately. When your dissertation goes into PQDT, it is going to a site that Google Scholar relies on as its authoritative source for dissertations. Moreover, consistent and predictable tagging ensure that abstract and other fields are correctly indexed. All right, as I close, I want to be very clear about something. And I'm going to use three of the exactly 400 total seconds I have available to me for a dramatic pause. Okay. Nothing, literally, literally nothing I've said so far is an argument against including your dissertation in your IR, or anywhere else for that matter. The argument I've been making here is what you might call an improv argument. It's not either or, but yes and. Yes, there is value in depositing your dissertation in your IR. And yes, there is value in submitting it to ProQuest. I started with one anecdote. I'm going to leave you with another. Last year, some colleagues and I visited the library of one of England's top two universities. I'm not going to say which one. We were exploring the possibility of working with a library in a pilot project that would involve digitizing old dissertations and adding them to PQDT. When we described the pilot, the librarian seemed interested, but she said her boss would never go for our offer. Why, we asked her. Because, she said, the library was facing an existential threat, and her boss was under pressure to justify its very existence. And one way you could do that was pointing out uh, that there were dissertations in the library's IR that you couldn't get anywhere else. So that seemed fair enough when you work for a company that tries to get people to use your resources. You really can't complain when the library tries to get people to use theirs. Even so, as we got up, I left the library with a single question. Can you, I said, can you think of one benefit, just one benefit, that the author gets from making the full text of their dissertation available in your IR and only in your IR? And that's the question I will leave you with, too. Thanks very much, and I'll give you five seconds back. <laughs> Questions at the end, so don't run away. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carol Kramer from Wake Forest University, and this is what we can learn from the big deal that never was. So the context here, very briefly, <laughs> is that back when big deals were hot to get, we got big deals at our institutions with six of the seven largest multidisciplinary academic publishers out there. I'm going to call those guys the other six, because this is the story of publisher number seven, who I'll refer to with the uncreative pseudonym of X. <coughs> so if we were to cancel a big deal, some of the things that we might assess after the fact is whether folks asked for new subscriptions, what kind of interlibrary loan impact there was, 
and what price increases there were. So this idea is without going to all the trouble or before going to all the trouble of canceling a big deal, let's look at this other publisher sort of as a natural experiment for what might happen. So that's what I did. So the first thing I did was I looked at a desiderata list that we have been maintaining for years, and you can put anything on this desiderata list, including, for instance, major print requests. But it's mostly databases and journals. So there are currently 102 items on that list, 40 journals, and as the slide already tells you, 45% of the journals are published by Publisher X. Now, it's possible this is just that Publisher X is doing a good job of buying up all the um, titles that we don't already subscribe to. 18% of all requests. Interestingly enough, one title is from one of the big deal publishers, but outside of the big deal, which is just another of those things that seems like sometimes the big deal is never quite 100%. The other thing we've been keeping track of locally is a most interlibrary loan list, which locally we define as five or more interlibrary loan requests for the same title in a calendar year. Therefore, our most recent data is 2018. Again, this is something we look at pretty much every year. If something's a returning character on that list, maybe we should subscribe. So I took that list, I took the, most three, the three most recent years, and then eliminated from the list any place where it's not possible to subscribe to something. For instance, people may request for things that have ceased. People may request for back files of journals we already have. Putting those aside, and looking at just the ones where it's feasible to make a decision to subscribe, I found that 75% of the titles in 2018 were published by Publisher X and then a majority of the other two years, with a total across the three years of 64%. One thing that's really uh, interesting about this is that seven titles showed up more than once. So other than the lesson that maybe I should start a subscription to those seven, I'm not quite sure what to do with this, because that means the rest of the titles were different titles every year. Does that mean, well, maybe we should have gotten into a big deal or something? I don't know. But there you are. And another thing we looked at was price increases. And um, UVA is not the only one that has done this, but they're a regional neighbor and a consortial neighbor. So <coughs> locally, they're very influential for us. And here's the URL if you want to look at this. But they have put out there for people to see what they're paying for big deals and what the price increases have been. So locally, we made our own version of this chart for these seven publishers, including our friend X. It turns out that X was the second highest of the seven when it comes to annual price increases. And annual price increases here includes both the effect of a, a journal increasing every year and the effect of takeover titles and new subscriptions, because we could, if you don't have all the titles, you can add more. You can also cancel. When I took out, I tried to control this a little bit better by taking out journals that were only paid in some of the five years that I did. So a 7% increase went down a little bit to 6.68%, but still second highest. So that means five of the big deals did better jobs of controlling costs than um, this one publisher where we didn't have a big deal. So what we learned locally, what you may learn the same or different if you do this at home, is that if you take the two sources of demand, the unmet request list and the interlibrary loan list, you could say either many or most of the unmet needs were published by this one publisher where we never got into a big deal. Personally, I take the interlibrary loan list as more of a revealed preference, people actually going to the trouble of uh, doing interlibrary loans. So in that case, you would say most, or you could say many. And that this, this particular non-big deal showed a higher annual price increase than most actual big deals. So maybe the big deals are doing a little bit of some, something to contain price increases. Of course, you could also point out, quite rightly, that we have had the freedom to cancel three quarters, all, half, whatever, from Publisher X that we have not had with the big deal. So that is something we have to think about. And I would like to thank Jody Upton from EBSCO, who helped me with some of this data, and also UVA and the folks who shared their photos. Thank you.
So my name is Russell Mahalik and my colleague Mike. <laughs> Go ahead. I misread I mispronounced your name, I'm sorry. Oh, that happens all the time. Sorry, we thought we weren't supposed to interview, so we just totally messed everything up. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to talk about Scott Lake Communications, and we did a focus group on EBSCO ADS versus SITEM, and which did our students prefer. Um, this is a little bit about us, to keep it brief. Um, Monica's going to talk about our institution. So a little bit of context about our institution. Anyone heard of Goldie Beacon College? It's okay, usually hands don't go out. So we're from Wilmington, Delaware. We're about 45 minutes south of Philadelphia. Um, we're just under 2000 FTE. We have an interesting program that we like to talk a lot about, which is on Saturdays. Um, and mainly international students take our graduate program on Saturdays. They take a class every other Saturday for eight hours a day. Four classes equals one class, one full class completed. So in two years, they complete an MBA. Um, this particular program actually fits the Immigration and Customs Service to your internship CPT program. Many students can extend their visas in the United States. So frequently we have students coming to us from much larger R1 institutions coming to extend and work while they're in the U.S. How this relates to our discovery service and comparing that to ethnic SIAB is that a lot of students come to our school and knowing exactly what SIAB is and they go there first rather than going to an ETS discovery service because that's what they're more familiar with and they come to schools that might not have any answers or not where to go so they just don't know they can go to SIAB. So you can talk about this. So last spring, we invited students, staff, and faculty so to participate in the focus group in the library, and we wanted to know what the students and the faculty and staff were thinking about EDS, um, our discovery tool, which we colloquially call Light and Search, as compared to their experiences in SciHub. Um, at the first, I think I actually convinced us to do this because when I mentioned we should actually do a focus group on SciHub, he gave me a bit of a librarian squint. I'm from outside of libraries, so I'm in institutional research, so I, I came from a larger institution where we couldn't find it, he went to SciHub. When I mentioned SciHub to him, he kind of gave me this look, are we sure we want to introduce this to them. I think I said I think they already know. So let's see what we find out. Um, so our, we we did our focus group. We had 15 undergraduate students, four graduate students. Um, 13 of them were female and six of them were male. Um, 12 of them came from the United States. The remaining seven came from around the world. As Monica mentioned, the graduate students do come from all over the world, and then we have the dependency requirements. Um, our average GPA for the undergraduates who did participate were 3.62, 3.26, 3, 3, 3, 3 and for the graduate students, it's slightly higher than 3.165. And here's what happened in our focus group. As Rusty mentioned, we had 19 individuals um, who participated in this focus group. We wanted to get some information about their past experience with, with information literacy instruction. Um, the way we do our on ground information literacy instruction is we've done it about for four years since right now. We have an information literacy assessment program that Rusty and I developed, which um, initially had done or addressed the, six, the five standards for um, um, AC or and now is going towards the framework. Um, we have face-to-face -face instruction. We have online instruction with training modules and assessments and post-tests. So this gives you some screen, um, data regarding what their experiences were with idle instruction before they came to our particular focus group. We wanted to know this because this, um, knowing they had added instruction, whether it was face-to-face -face or online, would tell us what they had learned potentially about lightning search in our databases. So 84% of them had worked in, in the database before and 16% of them were in the side of the garden and which, which side that the focus group was just invited being easier to use. And most of them found the Lightning Search EDS and were more useful than the side of I think that's mostly because most, a lot of them did not feel like DOIs. I think we still work with students a lot with using permalinks and DOIs. And depending on, we use APA the citation manual and the, that whole retrieve from disappeared is not happening in the 7th edition, it's not required anymore. And the focus group participants find lightning search simple to use, 89% uh, said yes. Um, did focus group participants find what they're looking for when they're looking for, and the, what content did they find, and again, 89% said yes. Um, which site did focus group participants find to be easier to use for search for the articles? And 84% of the people I find were found it easier for the articles, which is pleasantly surprising. So we took a look at the different time spent on looking for five articles at EDS, and as you can see, comparing Article 1 through Article 5, um, Article 2, two took slightly longer than the rest. Um, I'll point out, as I uh, reiterate, as Rusty mentioned, most of our students were having difficulty actually knowing what the DOI is, so if you're familiar with SIO, you know that that's usually kind of the easiest thing and why 
students and others tend to go to it because you can get the DOI, you plop it in, you have the article. Our students were not familiar with the DOI, so that actually made it a little harder for them to use it. Um, again, looking at average time of articles spent comparing on finding articles in Sci-Hub. Um, so the time spent, if we're kind of plopping back and forth between the two, they're just looking at slightly longer in Sci-Hub because, again, the DOI finding was, was a challenge for them. We, we did pick up these five articles because most, remember, you, most students are going there to look at the syllabus and so they have a specific thing that they're actually looking for. We do require faculty to use most of our databases to get the articles that they're looking for. So that average time spend was almost actually quite even in our EDS person versus side up. It took just slightly longer to do go through side up than to like um, research. Feedback joke with the students about, about side up and EDS. Most of them just found it easy. I think with our information literacy instruction, I think they're very comfortable going to databases. So we do find a lot of times that people still go to Google and try to form to wherever they want to go. Some people are very close to it, which will do what they wish to do always. <laughs> um, students' comments from the focus group. Some said, I had, I had one person said, I had to enter the board search to find the articles in EDS. So also, the layout of the light search was easier because you can just leave down a whole article and other information that the firms found what we're searching for. And they were both, one person thought they were both very similar, so I have, might have, been, have a better search algorithm. I was going to say that to a student. <laughs> <laughs> And students' comments about the other comments is the value of being able to search the database is measurable. Um, and because the lightning in EDS lets you spray. <laughs> so there you go. Thank you. We've <laughs> <laughs> got a nice uh, amount of time for discussion, so I invite uh, our speakers to be ready for. Some hard questions. Well, this may not be too hard of a question, but for, from this last presentation, do you expect you might get different results about the ease of use and the time taken if you were doing the focus group from off campus? Um, possibly. We also did a focus group on new people that we presented earlier on the new person from West Academic Central, and they like you knew a lot more. So it begs the question to ask to do more focus groups with higher population. So I think. We take it. We have to do this. We're going to really get better. Sense. And something that pops into my head for your question when you mentioned off campus. So thinking two different things. One, are we looking at it from the perspective of computer students who might have had less of an opportunity for face-to-face -face IL, therefore they were perhaps leaning on the online file instruction? Or are we looking at it from the aspect of they might be more honest if they didn't take the computer people with that in the library for this group? Because if you were wandering around during the focus group, so you kind of go at it. Yeah, now I'm, I'm thinking about the interaction of your authentication system. Well, we have OA, so we're using open outlets, so we have a single authentication. I would go two years ago, that wasn't the case, because we had passwords and any um, Word document that were shared on the sharing company. So we may now do much better on that. So, any questions? Uh, for ProQuest, I may have an answer to your final question in the form of a question. Do you charge a fee to the students to put their con their dissertation in your repository? Uh, no, no it's, it's, it's free. It's free? Yeah. Although the universities pay for it. Uh, nobody, nobody pays to um, submit their dissertation to ProQuest and have the kind of treatment that I described briefly. Um, the database itself is a subscription model, which which libraries is an actual question. Yeah, I believe um, you have, if a student wants their thesis or dissertation to be open access, then they have to pay That's you. Right. But if it's not That's open right. access, if it's only available if um, somebody wants to buy it from you later on, then it's free. Uh, that's right. There's currently a right. $95 fee dollars. to cover the costs of um, making it open access. $95. And I have a question for you about your approach to the German researchers. Sure. Did you inform the library that you were the libraries at those institutions? Uh, no, I didn't. I, I reached out directly to the faculty. Yeah, those libraries uh, get a little offended. That might have been. That might have been. And so to be very clear, I was absolutely upfront in what I was asking. I might use my ProQuest email. And uh, but, but no, I didn't. 
And if ToneQuest had a research institute or arm or unit and you presented yourself as that way, maybe they might have. Those are a couple yeah. of ideas. Here's yeah. someone else. I have a question for uh, Carol uh, Kramer about the, um, what we learned from the big deal that never happened. Did you look at the counter usage, comparing the usage uh, in the journals you subscribe to for the big deal versus the not big deal? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> we are, uh, well, I, actually no, that's not true. We, when we made our seven, I did not look at it to make this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> when we were compiled, the information that UVA has made public does have a um, number of titles with 1 to 50 uses or something like that. They break it down into usage brackets. And we did a parallel thing for all seven publishers, including X. I just didn't look at it very carefully um, because I was, you know, of course, with the non big deal ones, if there was a very underperforming journal, I would have just cancel it, which is, I think, the those who are exposing their usage data are trying to make the point, or if, if their goal is, hey, big deals are bad, they would want to make the point that there are a lot of journals that aren't getting used. If you want to make the point that big deals are good, then maybe you'd want to make the point that a lot of journals are getting used. Hopefully, the ones we're individually subscribed to are getting used. <laughs> Any thoughts for other of our speakers? Anyone here from Wisconsin? Are you experiencing the same thing as Stevens Point? No. Maybe a couple left over. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't want to. Well, no. It depends if you're public or private. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we do and have it, someone from is, a private. There is a turnaround we're seeing. You know, we did have a slight change in state government. So, not that I'm here to talk about politics. <laughs> politics is more than elections. We heard the same in another yeah. session about Kentucky. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, thoughts from other folks on uh, some things uh, that we are you planning on your uh, Sci Hub EBS to expand your uh, comparisons? Or, yeah, we're looking at doing another focus group uh, in, in the event that we migrate back to a different platform next year, which is a strong possibility given the content at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you said you have three concerts. How many of two? 2,200. 20, 20, the other thing they would like to do is expand it to faculty and do a right. comparison of those. those that, that population. And we have a big population change coming in the next two years or so because we're building our first on grad major construction in this years so we have a new norm going up and that's going to increase capacity for undergrads by six percent so we're even making a commuter campus before so we're going to have much more on ground students so that's going to be a different situation for us. Please. Um, on the side hub I just wanted to commend you all for doing that work and uh, I think it's so important. Uh, I'm a publisher at APS by the way part of the principal society. Uh, I think in the publishing industry there's this idea that uh, side hub is getting a lot of usage because people prefer the platform, even if they have access to the content somewhere else, uh, go to Sci-Hub. It's not so easy to untangle that um, globally. So I really appreciate that you're taking a step in that direction. Uh, but also I had a question that, in addition to the work you did to understand um, the students' perspectives, uh, do you guys do any, any education around you know, the sort of risks and dangers of, of Sci-Hub? We tried not to put points I have out too often. That's why I was cautious about it. First place. <laughs> uh, the information literacy classes saying, you know, if you can't find anything you're looking for, go to SciHub. Um, but there's always water cooler talk about people using it. I know that it does get used to prove that it's getting used, but I do know that downloads do decrease at certain times of the year as certain things are due. Um, so it was more of we needed to find the way to that. So, if they're not that familiar with it, they're more likely not going to it. We obviously have a lot of Well, and a big part of our um, institution that we make sure we're careful about as far as educating our students is that our computer literacy is quite low amongst our students. We have a lot of first gen. Um, so, when it comes to viruses, appropriate sites, those sorts of things, we probably have more than we have average out for our 
Um, same thing with fishing emails from faculty who respond and put in credentials on websites that are obviously not ours. So we're really careful with how we um, advise them on here's the preferred tools, and we try to keep the scope of the conversation for that. Occasionally, we'll get a question about, we've heard there's this site called, we're like, no, that's not good, let's go here. And we're trying to like, reframe it really quickly, just because not only the obvious reasons why we don't like direct ones bad, but also because I mean, you have to put in a password that looks like a Russian thing that comes up, and they don't know if yeah. it's accurate or not. So we're just concerned about them being in credit card numbers and all sorts of things. Yeah, there's lots of dangers around it, then there's the ones that are harder to untangle and explain to students around economics and you know, disrupting you know, the, the publications that they depend on. And versions, they don't really know what they're right. getting into. Uh, any other uh, thoughts, questions, comments, uh, ideas? Yeah, ideas for next year on any of these? Do we predict which of these will continue to be an issue next year? <laughs> Expo will buy a sign of our That's a nice one. The academic search universe. Wait, is that already up? I have to get to their highest level. No, no. That's so ultimate. You already got that. Yeah. So I, I know you're not at the institution in Virginia, but how do you think they get to disclose their prices that way? And is that common? I, uh, we we've hesitated putting anything out publicly, partly because we I think Virginia, being a state institution, has the whole open records law on their side. So there's mm -hmm. definitely their contracts cannot be confidential, whereas sometimes ours can be. So we've been a little bit more hesitant. We'd have to like look at each contract to see if there's a confidentiality clause that binds us as a private institution. But I wonder if other states do have. Has anyone seen that in other states where you can find an institution's? Spark has a big deal database where they post. You can look at them. I think there's this pretty incomplete though. The Spark database in this campus are dealers. I think doesn't have all of them. Yeah. yeah, I may be asked to leave when I get home. <laughs> but I'm tenured. Although we've lost tenured faculty as part of the reorganization of things, and I'm not fearful. My director knew I posted our budget online. Mm -hmm. you know, it is, so it's important. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes helps contextualize where you stand because uh, sometimes what did people used to say that uh, licensing journals sometimes is like used car dealer or, or airline where you talk to your neighbor and find out they paid a different price. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to collectively rebel against confidentiality clauses that we need transparency to make good decisions moving forward, particularly with transformative agreements. And, and we may not, in fact, have confidentiality clauses, especially since a lot of ours are done through the Carolina Consortium, which is a public-private yeah. partnership. We just have not yet gone to the trouble of looking into, you know, before we post, we need to make sure we can. Mm -hmm. We've been collecting um, that from folks from Gobi and comparing it to Amazon and the road paper about that. And we're working on putting the, all that stuff in the <coughs> and making data visualizations and trying to figure out the best place to house and share with our faculty and administration. So in the library community, we also need to push back with force against the constant price increases every year. And I don't understand what universe the price designers are living in when we're living in an economy of budgets that are at best flat, that system is going to collapse if it keeps on its current trajectory. And we just need to push back, because there's no money to absorb the price increases. So at Tennessee this year, we have, we have, we have some staff and acquisitions and continuing resources who um, we've been empowering more, and they really like this power. And so <laughs> the person who gets the renewals for the electronic resources, if they are um, over a 4% increase, then she has some just standard language that's been written for her asking for it to be decreased. And we're tracking that because we're at a point where we're going to start looking at cancellations. And that's going to matter when we start canceling is who has been working with us and who hasn't. Oh. 
Uh, a blacklist. Black huh? has it, it has. Yeah, she and she gets really excited. She's been there for 50 years, and this is the first time someone, that she's been allowed to do something like this. So she gets really excited when it works. Because I know the I tried out with a publisher, and they said, "Sorry, we can't do anything." And I simply went to three years of use of cost for use and reduced it by 50 mm -hmm. just to show them that I asked. Right. If, if they say no, then she bumps it to my department and collections, and we'll look at usage statistics mm -hmm. and other things, and we'll just we'll determine if, if the usage statistics look really bad, we'll just cancel it. Mm -hmm. um, well, otherwise, we wouldn't have even questioned it if they just reduced the, the increase at this mm -hmm. point, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if it's iffy, then I'll ask them about a multi-year agreement to get that increase down, and we'll review it again in a few and years. And if I could, at an individual letter, a level, I do that with every renewal that I yep. have electronic resources. However, some respond to me like Elsevier can be, oh, well, you have to understand, or we're working on it, or you, you can't understand, it's too complicated. Yeah. And I, you know, but, and when we're in with others, it's we can drop out but then it affects them but I'm not against dropping out either you know mm -hmm. but I will refuse and I have canceled things with progress with that scope <laughs> you know if they come in with six eight percent I say I can't do it you have to be flat or you know and or maybe it'll come down to two it progress was very complicated last year NAPSCO has been too but it's it's just uh, Several years ago, they recognized it and they did stay flat, but all of a sudden something's been happening where they're just, you know, anyway, enough said. <laughs> you have to say no or you have to say we have to talk about this. And that's what I want is a place of the conversation. And somebody in the previous session said uh, he's a little concerned about libraries that are still doing budget projections based on the current models of uh, journal subscription fees that we shouldn't be doing that even at our own sites. But yeah, data visualizations showing and maybe sharing that on the vendor side saying, we're doing cost cutting, what are you doing on your side? And, and an idea for your 50 year employee, uh, yeah. our affiliated hospital gave prizes to staff who came up with cost cutting measures. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. so we, we incentivize yeah. it on your staff. We have, um, uh, we call them the Spirit Awards, and last year a group in acquisitions oh. got a bunch of awards because just a data cleanup, but it equated like three hundred thousand dollars that they found. It wasn't really income; didn't need to be encumbered. It was like you know something that from migrations that just migrated over, and yeah. <laughs> Any final comments for our speakers? We've got a, just a few moments. Uh, any final thoughts? I, I'm sorry if I cut you off in mid sentence or started you awkwardly. Any final thoughts from any of you? Very thought-provoking, thank you. <laughs>